it becomes quiet. Only some of you? I think it's really freaking incredible. Like, how does that happen? How does a group of people, without, I didn't say, okay, everyone, settle down, right? I didn't do that. It just all of a sudden, it all went quiet. How that happens is actually of great interest, and it's not trivial. Um, and we'll be discussing it later in the term. Examine the shape of the income health relationship at the individual level. Uh, we reviewed Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the importance of autonomy and of social integration, sort of towards the top. And we considered some biological pathways by which the stress of social hierarchy might affect our bodies. And we talked a little bit about absolute versus relative deprivation, uh, the latter of which is an unavoidable byproduct of the intrinsic nature of hierarchy which arises both from the natural lottery and the social lottery, uh, and from the biological origins of making us social animals to begin with. The argument being that, in essence, it's impossible to avoid all hierarchy. Um, today, we're going to be considering the salubrious nature of social support. To what extent and how are social connections uh, beneficial? To what extent do, do social connections help uh, not only mollify or modify or attenuate some of the adverse consequences of hierarchy, but to what extent do social, does social support via a variety of other means uh, also provide uh, health benefits? But first, finishing up on a topic that we, uh, we introduced the last time regarding the health effects of hierarchy. What, would we, what, what we would really want to do, if we could, was to do an experiment where we randomize people to different stats. We took you guys and we made you high status, we took you guys and we made you low status, and then we followed you up and saw what were the implications of such randomization upon your health outcomes in different sorts of ways. And some experiments like this have been done with primates. I'll introduce such an experiment in just a moment to you. Uh, by experimentally manipulating their social standing. But there are also some other clever ways that you can imagine quasi-random or sort of natural experiments that could take place that might give us some insight into the role of status in health outcomes. And this is a clever idea that Don Riddlemeyer pursued in a paper that was also reviewed in the Marmot readings uh, for today. What they did here is they matched samples of actors, nominees, and winners of the Academy Awards to ask the question, well, does it help to win an Academy Award? Does it make you feel so great about yourself? Does it put you, does being at the top of this status hierarchy confer any benefit? <coughs> And when they looked at the life expectancy of birth, they found that actors as a group lived to be 75.8, nominees lived to be 76.1, and winners lived to be 79.7 uh, years old. So it looked like winning the Academy Award offered a net gain of 3.6 years in life expectancy, or a 25% reduction in death rate compared to nominees with a 95% confidence interval going between 5% and 41%. So, so at worst, in this estimate, winning uh, an Academy Award reduced your mortality by, by 5%, and at best, by 41%, but on average, or approximately, our best estimate is a 25% reduction in mortality by winning the Academy Award. That is a huge impact. That is actually vastly more useful to you than the mere little golden statue uh, that you get to take home. So what would be, in your mind, some non-causal? So the idea in this observational study is to claim that winning the Academy Award uh, lengthens your life. What might be some non-causal explanations for the association between winning an Academy Award and longevity? Other ideas? Um, Matthew, right? 
Yeah. Uh, people win and have it worse than how long Okay, so maybe the winners are richer actors, and it's the richer actors, it's the wealth of the actor that's making you, being a rich actor compared to being a poor actor makes you more likely to win, and therefore when you win, you live longer, and it's actually your wealth that's causing it. Other ideas. Yeah, Gianna. Um, actors who get, like, easy Oscar roles are usually more well-respected Okay, so they were already at the top for unobserved reasons. So it's not the Academy Award per se that's letting, lead, leading to their longevity. There was something else about them that resulted in them. Now, what's a methodologic feature here that Rettelmeyer introduced to try to address Gianna's concern? What's in the data here, there's some clue that that's really not what's happening. Yeah? Including the life expectancy and birth of the also. Yeah, so he says, well, okay, maybe the people that win are different than the actors, but here are the nominees, you know, and they, the winners does even better than the nominees. So if there was some other thing making you be more likely to be nominated, your concern could still apply, but this sort of mitigates that. Ruchi, you had something else to say? Uh, similar. Similar point. Other ideas? Yeah, what's your name? Emma. Emma. Um, maybe the actors who win Academy Awards are really disciplined about their acting, and are also really disciplined about other aspects of their life. Yeah, so maybe the reason, or maybe they're fitter in some way. Maybe they're more beautiful or stronger, or have some other features which the, uh, the people that are giving the award are picking up on. So it's not the fact that you won and are moved to the top of the status, it's some other aspect of you that leads you to win and that also leads you to, uh, to live longer. So it's the example that we discussed earlier in the class. So you are fitter in some way, and being fitter makes you win, and being fitter makes you live long. So it's not that winning makes you live long. That's not what's really happening. It's some other thing that's, make, that's uh, contributing to that uh, idea. So it's the usual sorts of concerns when we use uh, uh, observational data. Well, there was another study, more recently stu conducted study, a little bit better designed, that looked at Nobel laureates uh, and nominees from 1900 to 1950. Uh, and looking at the benefits of winning a Nobel Prize. Now, one of the things about this is you don't really know if you've been nominated for a Nobel Prize, and you typically don't know unless you live 50 years. So if I was nominated, I would have been nominated at birth, and I, I couldn't find that out now, okay? So you really can't know until 50 years later when the records are released. But it's possible to go back in time and see who was nominated and didn't win, and who was nominated and won, and it was a big surprise. So they looked at life expectancy at birth for 524 male physics and chemistry Nobel nominees. And they found that the nominees, who didn't know they were nominated, by and large, lived 75.8 years, and the winners lived 77.2 years, or 1.4 years gained, or again, a 26% reduction in the hazard of death using proportional hazards model, uh, models compared to the nominees, okay? So 25% reduction compared to the nominees. Now there's some, I won't go into it, but there were some other methodological features in this study that were preferable to the uh, Rettelmeyer study that made us a bit more confident in this particular uh, result. But again, the claim is that being given this incredible status boost uh, is enormously uh, helpful. And many, not, many winners of these prizes like this, whether it's the Nobel or other prizes, often when you talk to them, they have a kind of glow about them. They feel validated by their peers and by society. They feel elevated. It's not the money. It just makes them feel really recognized and appreciated. And that kind of feeling of connection and feeling of, of respect that you get from other people, uh, they describe, they're aware of it, makes them, sort of lifts them up in some way. Some people even say they now feel like they need to live longer in order to be able to contribute more to society, that they have higher expectations they, they have to fulfill. Now, there are all kinds of ways in which your relative standing, if we could experimentally manipulate it, uh, actually can affect uh, your outcomes. And in fact, whether or not you graduate into a recession affects your long-term wages and probably your health as well. So one thing I could do to manipulate, a natural experiment is to manipulate you guys. I could say, okay, some of you are gonna graduate into a booming economy, and some of you are gonna graduate into a terrible economy, and when you graduate in a terrible economy, you're gonna feel terrible about yourself. That that's gonna be a, how you feel about yourself is gonna be affected, and maybe that's going to have some effect on a variety of outcomes. This study looked at the, the effect on economic recession on young people's levels of narcissism. Here's the uh, unemployment rate uh, when you emerge into adulthood, when you graduate from college, 
And here's how narcissistic you are. And when you, when you graduate into a booming economy, you think you are responsible for this great wage that you're getting and the ease with which you found work. And aren't you wonderful? Because you've been lifted up to the top all of a sudden, right? And so you have high levels of narcissism. But conversely, if you graduate into a recession, you feel really terrible about yourself. You can't find a job. It's not paying well. You're, you're struggling in all kinds of ways. And you interpret that as being something about, something, uh, you know, about yourself. It's, an, again, a kind of a natural uh, experiment. And again, this illustrates the by now well understood point in this class of the difference between structure and agency, right? Here's a structural factor, the recession, the, the economic the unemployment rate at the time you graduate, which has nothing to do with your agency. You did not cause this unemployment rate, and yet has everything to do not only with your ability to find a job, but also with ostensibly internal states like your narcissistic uh, inclinations, for example. Now, of course, as we've been discussing, uh, as in the case of SCS and health, and as we saw in prior lecture, not only can there be two-way causation, so going both directions, but it can be more complicated still, wherein some third factor that is causing both outcomes, and, uh, and, and that is prior to both, uh, and, and this might be what's going on in the observational studies uh, that we've been discussing so far. And so, in fact, um, you need to use a variety of other statistical methods to the extent possible to tease this apart. So maybe it's something about your personality or appearance or your intelligence or some other observed factor that's causing you to win the award and live long. Maybe it's your longevity that causes you to win the award. If you live long enough, eventually you'll get the award. I mean, if there's a, a non-zero probability that I'll win some big prize, if I could make my life, if I could make myself immortal, eventually I'll win the prize. Mm -hmm. Or conversely, that winning the award lengthens your life. You can control for that by looking at age. Uh, and also, but the third possibility is that there's some other factor that's causing both of those things at the same time. Is that clear, some of these experiments or observational studies? So the idea is, what can we look in the world and see something outside the individual that manipulates their status quasi-experimentally, and then infer how does that manipulation in their status, how is it associated with health and other outcomes? <laughs> So the question arises, wouldn't it be great if we could randomize people to different statuses rather than merely looking at it observationally to see how they respond to stress, for example? And raise your hands if you've heard about this famous Stanford prison experiment. So about maybe a third to half of you have heard about this experiment. It's a very famous experiment that was con uh, conducted by Professor Zimbardo uh, in Stanford University. Um, he took 24 student volunteers who were screened for their physical and mental health and then they were randomly assigned to be either prisoners or guards in an experiment that was conducted in 1971 in a mock prison in the basement of the Stanford Psychology Department. So they took the psychology <laughs> department, and they took an aisle, and, they, uh, and a, a, a hallway, and they made little prison cells of the various rooms, uh, and then they put up like uh, fake walls in some locations, and half of you guys are going to be randomly assigned to be the role of prisoner, and half of you will be assigned to be uh, the role of a guard. And they had a two-week investigation, was the plan, into the psychology of prison life. And they end, ended the experiment in six days because of the situation that, uh, of, of, that emerged during the conduct of the experiment. Because in only a few days, as Zimbardo later observed, our guards became sadistic and our prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. So these students, what happened to these students is that they were, um, that they were told that they would be in, in this experiment. Uh, and then all of a sudden, on a quiet Sunday morning in August, in August, in Palo Alto, a police car swept through the town, picking up the college students who had been assigned the role randomly of being uh, a prisoner. Uh, they were uh, charged, they were warned of their legal rights, they were spread-eagled against the police car, they were searched, and they were handcuffed, often with other, their neighbors looking on in great surprise. Uh, so if you guys signed up for this experiment, and then the uh, you know, police came and, and arrested you, your roommates and people down the hall would be very surprised by this. The car then arrived at a station, the suspect was brought inside and he was, for, he was formally booked again, read his Miranda rights, fingerprinted and so forth, and then he was led to a holding cell and he was left blindfolded. And then each was systematically searched and stripped naked and then they were deloused with uh, delousing spray as well. And the experiment began with nine prisoners and nine guards. Three guards worked each of three eight-hour shifts, while three prisoners occupied each of the three barren cells around the clock. And the cells were so small that there was room for only three cots on which the prisoners slept or sat, and there was room for little else. 
Now the guards were given no specific training in what to do. It's like if I took a bunch of you and said, okay, you're gonna be prison guards now, and didn't really tell you how to manage uh, the process. Um, but, uh, but, um, but one of them was appointed the warden uh, of, the, of the prison of Stanford University. Now the first day passed without any incident, uh, and so everyone, including the investigators, were surprised and totally unprepared for the rebellion that broke out on the second day. Because on that day, the prisoners removed their stocking caps, ripped off their numbers, and barricaded themselves inside the cells by putting their beds against the door. And the guards were very much angered and frustrated by this development. And they decided that they needed to do something, especially when the prisoners began to taunt and curse them. And when the morning shift guards came in, they became upset at the night shift, who they felt had been too lenient and not done anything. And so the guards broke into each cell, stripped the prisoners naked, took the beds out, forced the ringleaders of the prison rebellion into solitary confinement, which they made up on the spot, and generally began to harass and intimidate the prisoners. And less than 36 hours into this experiment, one prisoner, so-called prisoner 8612, began suffering from acute emotional disturbance, disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying, and rage. It actually makes you wonder what we did to the prisoners in Guantanamo, or what is done to prisoners elsewhere in the world, not just us. I mean, uh, regimes that torture and abuse prisoners, or even in our prisons in this country, we have the highest incarceration rate. You know, the incarceration rate in our society is higher than in Stalinist Russia, just as an aside. We have more prisoners, people in prison in our society, than, in, than were in the gulags, actually. It's, it's un unbelievable. And here, just 36 hours of a fake prison, I mean, the guy presumably knew he was a Stanford undergrad and hadn't actually committed any crimes, is enough to reduce this person to this type uh, of a situation. And Zimbardo later said, I ended the study prematurely for two reasons. First, we had learned through videotapes that the guards were escalating their abuse of prisoners in the middle of the night when they thought no researchers were watching and the experiment was off. Their boredom was driven, had, was, was, had driven them to ever more pornographic and degrading abuse of the prisoners. And second, and this is something that really always surprised me about this case study, a Stanford, a recent Stanford PhD, a woman by the name of Christina Maslick, who had been brought in to conduct interviews with the guards and the prisoners, strongly objected when she saw her prisoners being marched on a toilet run, bags over their heads, legs chained together, hands on each other's shoulders. Filled with outrage, it took this graduate student that was visiting to say, what the hell is going on here? Filled with outrage, she said, it's terrible what you are doing to these boys. Out of 50 or more outsiders who had seen our prison, she was the only one who ever questioned the morality of our experiment, he said. Once she encountered the power of the situation, once she encountered the power of the situation, however, it became clear that the study should be ended. And so after only six days, our planned two-week prison simulation was called off. And these are some uh, photographs taken. Here's a Stanford County prison. Uh, here's one of the people who uh, was the guard. Here's one of the students that was assigned to be the prisoner given demeaning tasks like watching, uh, watching the toilets, uh, blindfolded, and so forth in the, in the basement. And actually, years later, there was a reunion of, uh, of the prisoners and the guards in this experiment. And you can find all this on prisonx.org. And actually, the guards and the prisoners still uh, were not you know, of a frame of mind to forgive uh, the guards or see things differently. They were really marked. Uh, by this experience. So here again is, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about this experiment, not just ethical. A lot of people say this really wasn't a fair experiment. It was never published in a peer-reviewed journal. It's become an iconic experiment. It could, certainly could not be repeated given current ethical uh, compunctions. Um, although some people have repeated it using avatars, very interestingly, actually. Uh, and um, uh, so it has a number of scientific critiques and ethical critiques about this experiment. But nevertheless, an experiment in which people's status was randomly uh, manipulated. Now, we can also do experiments, however, with other... Pro Any questions about that so far? Yeah, Brooks, I think that is, right? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, oh, by the way, uh, congrats on the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Silamanders, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's one of that's more than 12% of you clapping, because then, good for you. But if it's just 12%, I'm in trouble. Or, or 9%, rather, I'm sorry. Yeah. So the prisoners of the study could drop out and they wanted, right? Yes, they could have. I, I don't know what, actually, that level of detail, whether any of them said, look, I'm out of here. Uh, and, you know, how, how manipulated they were not to leave. Maybe they were not, maybe it wasn't quite as easy. 
All right. Now, we can also do experiments with other primates manipulating their rank status. And in humans and in other primates, adverse social environments often translate into lasting physiological costs. These experimenters explored an experimental system that consisted of 10 social groups of female macaques in which each individual's social status, that is to say their dominance rank, could be experimentally controlled in these groups of primates. And using this paradigm, they showed that dominance rank results in a widespread yet plastic imprinting on gene, regula excuse me, gene regulation, such that peripheral blood mono um, mononuclear cell gene expression uh, could predict social status with 80% accuracy. So if I took your peripheral blood and I took, uh, I took out a certain type of white blood cell from your peripheral blood and I studied the gene expression within those white blood cells, just knowing that alone, which genes were expressed. There's no, there's no, it's not that which gene, it's not which allelic variants, which variants of genes were present in the individuals. It's which genes were turned on. If I could see which genes were turned on in your blood, not yours, but your monkeys, uh, in the blood of these macaques, uh, I could uh, predict their status by looking at the relative expression of certain, um, of certain genes. And they grouped the subjects according to their dominance rank as shown in panel A. So, uh, so here's the dominance rank of these, uh, of these macaques. They're, the low rank ones are here, and the high rank ones are there. And they look at the, uh, I can't read that anymore, what the y-axis says. It says aggressive, oh, how much, how much aggression they received. And so the bottom ranked, the bottom ranked ones uh, received the most aggression from their peers, and the top ranked ones received the least aggression from their peers. And then they looked at the gene expression profiles in these, uh, in these uh, animals, and they explored the mechanistic basis of these effects using this profiling and a variety of other assays. And they were able to, de to demonstrate that actually these ranks uh, uh, affected uh, the, uh, the, the ranks affected the expression of about uh, 694, 70% uh, of about 1,000 genes uh, that they were looking on. And so here what they find is, is that different genes were up, these are expression profiles, this is upregulation in high ranking females here, so these genes were upregulated. Uh, conversely, these, the same genes were downregulated uh, in these, uh, or not upregulated in any case, in the low ranking females. So I won't go into the details of how this is coded, but the gist of it is that different genes, the, the, the proteins produced, there was the relative balance of proteins produced by different uh, genes was modified according to the rank status of these individuals. And then they were able to experimentally manipulate whether you were high or low rank in the system, and then check and see how different genes were up or down regulated according to manipulating your rank uh, status. So in sum, in this experiment, they were able to demonstrate a molecular response to social conditions, particularly as it turned out in the immune system, and, the, and to demonstrate a key role for gene regulation in linking the social environment to individual uh, physiology. So one of the macro ideas that I'm very interested in, both in my lab and in discussing with you in this class, is how it is that the, not only how the, the, the biological becomes social, but how the social becomes biological. How is it that social exposures get under our skin, become literally embodied? So here's an example of how we can begin to trace out the mechanism by which, for example, here we're talking about social rank, but we might even begin to think about other kinds of things like poverty. How does poverty kill you? How does it do that exactly? What effects does it have on your body? And can we drill all the way down to understand the mechanisms by which different sorts of social exposures get biologized, literally become embodied uh, within you? So to summarize, was there any questions about this so far? So to summarize where we are so far, um, low socioeconomic status or low income can be linked to poor individual and population health um, in several ways. Those in the lowest group may have worse health because they lack the resources to acquire health, they have poor nutrition or housing, for example, and no doubt this happens. But as we have seen, this cannot explain the gradient in health seen even at the upper levels of the socioeconomic status. Moreover, those in the lowest group may have adequate resources in an absolute sense, but they may still suffer because of their relative position. Being at the bottom is bad, regardless of one's absolute circumstances. And this is one of the ways that income inequality might, in fact, be harmful. And in fact, perceptions of being relatively deprived are stressful, 
And it's these psychosocial factors, more than the material factors, that play a role in ill health. Moreover, being at the bottom can interfere with your capabilities, as we discussed the last time. And finally, it is possible that not just those at the bottom, but that everyone suffers from income inequality. For example, by underinvestment in public goods, such as pollution prevention, or public education, or, or EMT services, uh, for instance. Okay, so inequality exists, it affects your health, it can do so by affecting absolute and relative standing, the variety of mechanisms by which it's done so, this is where we are now. So the question then becomes, how do humans cope with stress, whether it origi originates from physical or social circumstances? And coping strategies beyond intrinsic biological ones, that is to say beyond your body's immediate response to being stressed, consist of behavioral and or cognitive attempts to manage specific stressful situational demands. You can draw on personal resources of various kinds to do this. So when you're under stress, what happens? You can have a biological response to stress. Your body can start pumping out fibrinogen or releasing epinephrine like we discussed a couple of times ago. You can have a cognitive response. You can start using your mind and thinking, you know, what am I going to do? I'm not actually a prisoner, right? I'm just a Stanford student. I actually can walk out of the psychology department. These are not real guards. I don't actually, you know, you can think. You can have a behavioral response. You can start to behave in different ways, good or bad, in response to stress. Or you can cope with the stress using a variety of social uh, mechanisms. And simple-mindedly, if you can do something about the problem, you draw on behavioral resources. You change your actions in order to fix it. And if not, then you attempt to develop a sense of personal mastery, cognitively or psychologically. So you say, well, I can't get out of this situation. There's a math test tomorrow. I'm just going to accept it. And the distribution is going to be terrible, and I'm just going to accept it. Uh, that's a cognitive response. A behavioral response would be what? Studies. Study, yeah, that's the behavioral response. The behavioral response is study harder, right? And a cognitive response is the professor's a jerk or something, you know? I mean, there are different ways to cope with this, the impending uh, stress. And another response you might do is you talk to your friends, right? Who are also in the same boat. Oh my God, this is a really hard test. What do you think? Oh my God, it's a terrible test, etc. right? And how do you feel when you talk to your friends about stressful circumstances? Raise your hands if you feel better when you share your misery with your friends. Right? I mean, it's, you feel good when you talk about sad things with your friends or good things. But, you know, there's something about social interactions that's going to relieve or buffer your stress. So you can draw on social support to buffer the impact of stress. And interestingly, evidence suggests that perceived support is often as important or real received support. Actually, just the fact that you think people care about you can be actually as good as having people who actually care about you. And having a significant other is a key determinant of social support. We will be turning next to the, to the very considerable importance of social support and social networks to one's health after today. So next, actually not after we come back from break, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about social networks. But for starters, I want to begin to introduce some basic ideas having to do with interpersonal support that can be offered between individuals. One classic study in this regard was actually conducted by Emil Durkheim, who looked at suicide over 100 years ago. And he suggested that people living in more socially isolating societies, that is to say less integrated ones, are more likely to take their own lives. So social support actually keeps you alive. Feeling connected to others was his claim, a basic claim to which we've already returned several times uh, in the class. And you may remember that we began the class, actually, with this example. And in fact, there's been a long history of work looking at the risk of suicide and how that relates to the extent of one's social connections. Here are the results of one very recent study, or relatively recent, looking at both suicide and traumatic deaths, which when they, especially when they occur in men, reckless uh, deaths are often hard to distinguish from suicide. And so what he found in the study was here's a relative risk of death according to whether you're not married, has no close relatives, or does not belong to a church compared to whether you have these uh, features. So not married versus married, no close relatives versus having close relatives, belonging to a church, not belonging to a church versus belonging to a church. And each one of these social risk factors significantly increases your risk of suicide or traumatic death. So being unmarried, having no close relatives, or not belonging to a church increases your risk of suicide. 
And more generally, there's a wealth of literature over the past few decades that has confirmed the benefits of social connections. Here's a summary looking at individual risk of death in men taken from your readings. Uh, so what we show, show here is age-adjusted mortality rate according to level of social integration from low to high. So these lines are generally higher in different samples. So here is the Evans County whites, for instance. So the whites in Evans County, if they have low social integration, they have the highest age-adjusted mortality rate. It sort of declines, especially from year to year, but it keeps declining as they get higher and higher levels of social integration. Here's a famous Alameda County study. So at low levels of integration, you have a higher risk of death. At high levels of integration, you have a lower risk of death. And actually, the death rate, the, you know, the, the, the a relative risk of death from having low integration is about 2.4 times that which it is at, uh, at high levels of integration. But the nature of this effect, even in this study here is showing men taken from your readings, may depend on the environment. For example, in Tecumseh, in Evans County, and in Finland, all of which are shown here, which are more rural, there's a more nonlinear effect as if there's a threshold for men. So in the Finnish samples, it goes down and then sort of flattens out. Uh, and here's Tecumseh right there, it, that it sort of, there's a kind of uh, a, a nonlinearity, kind of it flats. So when you get to this point, it sort of flattens out the curve. Whereas for some other of the curves, it's not the case. So for example, for uh, Gothenburg, it does, it's a smoother decline. Or for Evans County Black, for example, it's a flat line across. It's just a hint. I'm not saying that that's actually necessarily what's happening. But the data may suggest that. And it's as if, however, social integration is especially important or remains important across the whole spectrum to men in cities. So if you're in a rural area, you need just a little bit of integration, and then the rest is OK. But if you're in a city, if you're a man in a city, Actually, social integration keeps benefiting you no matter where you are on the spectrum. And this, these effects that we've been discussing here are stronger in magnitude than many conventional risk factors for mortality. Actually, whether you have friends or are married explains more of the variance in your mortality than whether you are a smoker. Whether you live or die will depend much more on what kind of personal relationships you have than whether or not you're exposed to tobacco. Although both are bad. The female risk ratios are smaller for men, especially in rural populations. So this was also taken from your readings. These numbers, all these curves are lower for the women than for the men, and the curves are nowhere near as steep. So women, it seems, benefit less with respect to their health from social connections. This may be because women are healthier than men to begin with. It may be because uh, women benefit in other ways socially, just not in their health. For example, they may have economic returns, or they may be have greater life satisfaction. So I'm not saying that social connections are unimportant to women. I'm only saying that the relative impact of social connections on women's health is lower than the relative impact of social connections on men's health. And in fact, the single most important source of social support in the lives of adults is whether they have an intimate partner, that is to say, typically a spouse. This slide shows the probability of survival beginning with a population at, at around 48 over time. Uh, and these are the survival curves for people who are married, people who are widowed, people who are divorced, and the never married. So there's a kind of graded response across categories, and the bottom line is that this curve dominates the other curves. Having, an, having your partner alive reduces your risk of mortality significantly. And our best estimate, based on observational studies, is that if we could take a group of 10,000 men and randomly assign half the men to be married to randomly chosen women. They can't pick their own wives. We're going to randomly assign them the wife. In this experiment, men would gain seven years to their lives. So if we could randomly assign men to be married to randomly chosen women, they would gain seven years to their lives. If we did the same experiment with women, and we took half the women and randomly assigned them to be married, half of them, to randomly chosen men, my wife used to joke that it would subtract seven years from the women's lives, but actually the, the, uh, the, the, the women gain two, but they only gain two years to their lives from entry into marriage, our best estimates using observational data. There's a very interesting hint, there's not great science on this, but there are hints if you look at homosexual unions. And our best estimate is that if you randomly assign men to be randomly married to other men, take half the guys in this room, randomly pick a spouse for them who's a guy, randomly chosen, that you would gain two years to your life 
and that women would gain seven years of their lives. <laughs> so it's not marriage that's salubrious, it's marriage to a woman that's salubrious. <laughs> and there's something actually about being connected to women that is, uh, of, I believe, very deep and fundamental biosocial significance. Actually, fathers of more daughters live longer than fathers of more sons. Uh, having more women in your life across a variety of studies seems to uh, lengthen your life in a variety of ways. So entry into marriage is helpful and at the beginning of the class I think we introduced some ideas very briefly I think in the first lecture and to the extent that entry into marriage is helpful, exit from marriage uh, is harmful. And this is known as the widower effect or the widowhood effect or dying of a broken heart. And the widowhood effect is the increased probability of the recently bereaved to die. And it's a very well described demographic phenomenon, which you'll be reading about in, uh, when we study social networks, and I think it's chapter two or three of Connected. It's been, look, it's been understood for 150 years. People have looked at this with multiple studies. It's more pronounced in men than women. Men suffer more from the death of their wives with respect to their health. I'm not talking about anything other than mortality right now. Men are more likely to have their health compromised when their wife dies than women are to have their health compromised when their, her husband dies. The relative risk of death in men is between 1.3 and 2. That means my risk of death goes up between 30% and 100% when my wife dies. And the mechanism is felt to be multifaceted. And this is a canonical finding in the social sciences. It was first described, well, the history may go back to the 18th century, but it was first sort of well described by William Farr in 1858. And like Durkheim and suicide, like the incest taboo, like the law of supply and demand, the widowhood effect is kind of one of the canonical central findings in the social sciences. It's a basic fact of our existence. It's seen pretty much everywhere and pretty much at all times by and large. Anywhere you look in any population, when people's spouses die, their risk of death goes up. And it's supported by countless observational studies. So here's typically what happens. So let's look at the risk of death. This slide shows the timing of health benefits of marriage. So here's the risk of death. And here are the men in the dark line and the women in the dotted line. Now the men's risk of death is higher than the women's because men always have a higher risk of mortality than women. Okay? So it starts out pretty high. Here the man gets married. And it turns out if you trace out what happens to him, he's a very abrupt decline in his risk of death upon entry into marriage. And demographers have called this the getting rid of the motorcycle in the garage phenomenon. So <laughs> when you get married, your wife says, put away childish things, get a job, no more beer, no more drugs, no more bicycle, you know, that has to go. You've got to wear your helmet now, a totally different uh, lifestyle for you. So there's a very abrupt decline, which often has to do with a decline in traumatic injuries and other kinds of acute events. And then, as the, then the risk of death stays like this. This is a cartoon, guys. It's not exactly like this, but roughly speaking. And then when the wife dies, the man's risk of death has this incredible spike up. Uh, and then it gradually begins to return, but never quite to baseline. So after my wife dies, I have this incredible spike in my risk of mortality. But over the course of 6 to 12 to 24 months, my risk of death returns to what it would have been if my wife hadn't died. Does everyone follow the pattern so far? general pattern. Now women have a rather different situation. Women have a lower risk of death at baseline. When they enter into marriage, they do benefit some, but much slower. It's not immediate, the benefits to women upon entry into marriage. So they get some health benefits, but it's a kind of slower acquisition of these benefits. And when their husband dies, they don't spike their mortality. It's a kind of gradual increase in their mortality uh, with passage of time uh, going up uh, in this fashion. And, um, and there are a variety of ideas uh, about how this might, uh, might happen. And in the, in the generation of people that was my age, it's a little unclear if the mechanisms are the same for your generation, but for the generation of my age and older, the typical scenario when people try to understand well, what are the mechanisms by which entry into marriage prolongs the life of men, uh, the idea was that when you enter into marriage, what your wife does for you is give you social connection. She loves you. She, we're talking about heterosexual unions. She loves you. She introduces you to her friends. She manages her social life. She connects you to other people. Okay? 
But when a, for the generation my age and older, when a women entered into marriage, what do they get from the men? Typically, what they got from the men was economic stability and equality. That is to say, entry into marriage into men increased the economic circumstances for women in the, my generation and older. Okay? Your generation is a little different. Wages are equilibrating between the sexes. So some, this has led some monographers to say that uh, this is actually the age-old trade-off of trading sex for money, which is very sexist and disturbing, but appears to be the case, that actually the way in which marriage was salubrious across most parts of the world until recently, and there's some evidence from Scandinavia now that suggests that this is no longer quite the case, was that women gained economic opportunities upon entry to marriage, and men gained social connections. Now the reason this mechanism, this is summary, there are actually many more things that are going on. The reason this is especially interesting, however, is that it may also help explain the timing upon exit from marriage. So in my generation and older, when the man dies, the thing that he was bringing to the marriage, namely financial assets, typically is still present. He had life insurance, uh, he had uh, he accumulated assets, there's a pension. So when I die, my wife still gets the thing that I was bringing to the marriage that was making her stay healthy. You with me so far? But when my wife dies, what happens to me? I lose the thing that she was bringing to the marriage that made, was making me healthier. So I'm not talking about whether my wife or I suffer more emotionally from the loss. I'm not saying that men love women more than uh, their, men love their wives more than women love their husbands. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking narrowly about the issue of increased risk of mortality. One of the reasons for the different pattern may relate to the mechanism, the social mechanism by which this biological effect comes to pass. Now, we should also make it quite clear that from the very beginning, when William Farr was talking about this, actually it was originally this phenomenon was initially was engaged in the social sciences in the, in the 1740s, when people at the time uh, were really interested in whether, uh, whether monks and nuns who were living in a holy state would live longer. They were having this very pure life. Would being a monk or a nun prolong your life? And they found very quickly that monks and nuns weren't living as long as married people. And that really caused a theological conundrum for them. How could that be? So people began to wonder, what was it about being solitary that was potentially affecting people's uh, survival. And they were mathematicians, were, believe it or not, were looking at this, some Dutch mathematicians, for about 100 years or so, till William Farr comes along. And in that 100 year pe period, people had already identified a number of reasons that married people might live longer. And there are three. This is very important. It'll come back again when we talk about social networks. So one idea is causation. This is the idea, this is the tendency of the married to become well. Okay? Being married lengthens your life, is the claim. Having a social intimate, having a sexual partner, having someone who love, you love and who loves you lengthens your life. That's the claim. Okay? Causation. The tendency of the married to become well. But right from the beginning, people appreciated that it could actually be the reverse. It could be the tendency of the well to become married. Maybe only really fit individuals were able to enter into the matrimonial state. And the people who were unable to become married, there was something wrong with their health. That's why they were not able to become married. So that was the tendency of the well to become married, or homogamy, that people, well individuals, found each other and were able to get married. And the well, the fitter you were, the more likely you were able to become married. So if I am sick, I can only get a sick spouse, if any, and my spouse, when she dies, my risk of death is seen to be higher, but it's not because my spouse has died, it's because the death of my spouse is a, a marker for my relative sickness. She was sick and that's why she died, and so now I look like I'm dying because she died, but that's not really the reason. I look like, like I'm dying because I was sick, and I was sick and I could only get a sick spouse. Do you understand what I'm saying? Is that clear? So my, it's not my wife's death that's causing me to die. My wife's death is merely a marker for some unobserved sickness in me. And she's dying because she's sick, and only well people marry the wellest people, sick people marry the sickest people, if anyone at all. So that's the second <coughs> idea of homogamy. And the third idea is something known as confounding. So maybe, for example, my wife, I die, and then you see my wife die right after me, but maybe it's because I'm driving a car and I, we're both in the car and we hit a tree. And so I die and my wife dies right after me because we both hit the tree at the same time. 
or there's radon in our basement, okay? So I die and my wife dies because we're both exposed to radon in the basement. My death is a marker for the radon in the basement. So my death gives you information about my wife's risk of death, but it's not that my death caused my wife's death. Do people understand that idea? Three different reasons why my health could be associated with my wife's uh, health. Now this slide uh, is an experiment I did with a former graduate student of mine, Felix Elwert, in which we said, now, if it's the case that, uh, that uh, homogamy is the cause of this relationship, if it's the case that well people marry well people and sick people marry sick people, the death of my ex-wife should also increase my risk of death, right? Because my first wife, I was a well person, I married a well person, then we got divorced, and then I married my new wife. If my ex-wife dies, it should contain some information about my relative risk of death, my sickness. Do you understand this thought experiment? And that means that if we, but we don't think that my ex-wife's death is actually causing my death. Most people don't care what happens to their ex-partners, uh, their ex-wives, their ex-husbands. So it's not like I'm so forlorn that my ex-wife died that that's causing my death. If my risk of death goes up when my ex-wife dies, it must mean something about the tendency of the well to become married rather than the married to become well. Do you understand the point? It's hard, all right? This is a kind of clever way of entering into this topic. So we imagine a number of possible explanations. This is the causation idea that I introduce you to. My wife is lengthening my life. This is the homogamy idea, the idea that you know, well people marry well people or well people are able to get married. And this has to do with the shared environmental exposures, for example, like the radon in the basement idea uh, that we were discussing. And then we looked at a sample of current wife and husband, ex-wife and husband, so an ex-wife and current wife. So now we also said, well, if my ex-wife dies, does it make my current wife's risk of death go up? The women, uh, when you're looking at the men, what might be uh, 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 that? And here the idea might be maybe there's something in me that's killing my wives. So maybe I'm the source of the problem. And when you look at all this pattern, we can actually use this to begin to identify the different effects that we've been discussing. You would expect that if my, if my current wife dies, that it should be associated with causation or homogamy or present or permanent shared exposures. But if there's an effect of the ex-wife upon the husband that can only be caused by homogamy or by past exposures, it cannot be causation. And in fact, when we look at the data, we find no evidence that ex-wife's death increases the risk of death of the husband. So the failure to find an effect of the ex-wife's death on the husband's risk of death suggests that actually the risk of death, the reason that my wife's death affects me is not because of homogamy or confounding, but rather because of the causative effect. Do you understand the experiment? Or the idea of this? This isn't really an experiment. It's a kind of natural experiment. Am I overwhelming you with detail? OK. Um, now, when discussing social support, it's important to attend to several aspects um, of the support. This is something we haven't discussed or introduced yet. So right now, so far, I've just said, well, imagine you social support from your peers. You go to church, or you're part of a group, or your partner you know, you're connected to someone, and that's beneficial to you. Well, what exactly is that doing for you? How, how does that work for you? And there are a number of aspects of the social support you need to think about. You need to think about how much support is there, the extent of the support, the content of the support. What actually is, your, is this person doing, is your friend doing for you? They could be selling you drugs. That would be not a helpful thing to do. Uh, or they could be help you, helping you study. That would be a, good, a helpful thing to do. Or as we discussed earlier in the kind of sexist example, uh, I could be giving my wife money, she could be giving me friendship. That's the content of the support that we are exchanging. There's a reciprocity of the support. Is it fairly equal? Like I'm helping you, you're helping me. And there's the, whether it's perceived or real. Uh, maybe I just think I'm getting support from someone versus it's actual uh, support. And you can think about how many ties do I have? Or how intimate, long-standing, or mutual are the ties? Or how interconnected are the ties of the people I know, how interconnected they are? What am I exchanging with the people? How diverse are my connections? Do I have only one kind of people in my life or do I have many kind of people in my life? So social support is not always the same thing, right? Social support is not a unitary thing. It's not like a chemical. I can give you some social support. You need to define and understand what we mean when we say social uh, support. 
And social support is not the same thing as a social network. A social network, as we'll see in a few lectures, is the actual topology, the actual architecture of ties that you can define around an individual. And I also need to point out that social relationships can be burdensome or even harmful. For example, we introduced a few lectures ago the idea of secondhand smoke. So if your partner smokes, it increases your risk of death. Uh, or intimate partner violence. Having a partner is not necessarily a good thing if that partner is, is violent towards you. Uh, or partners can impose risk uh, requirements to be helpful. Being connected to people, even if you love them, actually can sometimes be very burdensome and can harm your health, especially over the long haul. The mechanism of this effect and the pathways of the effect are actually quite complicated. So now we're going to begin to think about, okay, well, what exactly is social support doing to affect your, uh, your survival? Here's a study that looked at social isolation and how it was associated with the onset of illness, in particular, cardiovascular disease. So this shows the, relative, the adjusted relative risk of cardiovascular disease, again, in men, looking at fully integrated. I'm focusing on men for many of these studies because men see these benefits much more than women. Um, so this is the adjusted relative risk of cardiovascular disease. Fully integrated men uh, have a, a relative risk of one, and socially isolated men have a risk almost double of uh, fully integrated men. So the more isolated you are, the more likely a man is to have the onset of cardiovascular disease. And social isolation is also associated with the outcome of cardiovascular disease after its onset. So, so this slide shows mortality after myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, depending on the number of sources of emotional support. Let's look first at the men. And so if the men have zero sources of emotion, emotional support, they might have a 60% chance of dying after they have heart attack. Whereas if they have one or greater than or equal to two sources of social support, they might have significantly lower risk of death. So if you have a heart attack and you're alone in the world, you might have a 70% chance of dying. But if you're married, you might have half as much the risk if you're a man. Something similar for women in a kind of graded way. Here this looks at age and it looks at older people versus younger people the effect both in the relatively young and in the older, and the effect seems to be especially important amongst the elderly. So if you're an elderly person with a heart attack, having someone who loves you or can provide emotional support reduces your risk of death. This is always among individuals who already have had a heart attack. And this risk factors are more important even than some of these conventional, I won't go into it, so-called kill-up scores that quantify uh, how bad your heart attack is. So whether or not you're married can explain more of the variance in your mortality than, uh, than this biological measure about how uh, bad your, uh, your underlying uh, cardiovascular disease uh, is. And here, uh, what was done in this study is they were asked, can you count on anyone to provide you with emotional support, talking over problems or helping you make a difficult decision? That was the question. And then it looked at, um, it looked at how many individuals each of you could give in response to that question. One of the very appealing aspects of this study, this study was done at Yale and the Beta Hospital, by the way, years ago. One of the very appealing aspects of this study is it measured this years before the heart attack took place. So if you become sick, let's say you go out and you find you guys are sick and you guys are not sick, and I see that you guys don't have any friends and you guys have friends. What are two possible explanations for that? You sick guys, why don't you have friends? Why might you not have friends? You guys are sick and you have no friends. Why? Yeah? Yeah, you're sick. So, so you're sick and that's why you lose your friends. Your friends abandon you when you're sick. It's not that your lack of friends made you sick, it's that your sickness made you friendless, right? So, so how can I be sure that which of those is happening? Which direction? Well, I measure how many friends you have today and then I look in the future to see how sick you become. So that's what they did in this study. They measured baseline connections and then they looked later on, after you had a heart attack, how did your social connections uh, modify the risk of the heart attack? And here's some results looking at whether the diversity of a person's social support is beneficial. These are results from a, a clever experiment that deliberately exposed people to infection and was taken from your readings. And in this study, they assessed the relationship between social network diversity and whether an exposure to a virus can make you sick. And they found a relationship between network diversity and infectability. So here they look at the percent. So here what they did is they brought people into a, a laboratory in Chicago uh, and they locked them up for a few days 
and then they drop rhinovirus droplets into their nose to deliberately infect them. And before they deliberately infected them, they, uh, they measured how diverse their social networks were. What kind of a variety of people are you connected to, all right? And then they quantified how bad the, uh, the cold was by doing everything from asking you how bad is your cold to weighing the snot in the tissues. So like you're producing a lot of snot, they collect all the tissues and they weigh them, and then they quantify it in that way. And then they look at the percentage that are dead infected and how severe the colds are according to network diversity, and they find that people with greater diversity are less likely to become infected when experimentally exposed to a rhinovirus. And the argument that social network diversity, as well as other attributes of networks, like their size or connectivity or reciprocity, is salubrious, rests in part on this kind of causal chain which people are actively trying uh, to tease out. So the question is, OK, you have a more diverse social network. Maybe that results in decreased stress, or maybe that results in improved self-worth. Here's the psychological and psychosocial pathway. So you have a more diverse network, you feel better about yourself, maybe that makes you behave better, and this leads to better resistance, so your immune system is better. Or maybe you have a more diverse network, and that leads to decreased stress, which leads to hormonal changes, which can also be caused by improved self-worth, which leads to a better immune function, and both of those lead to better health. Or maybe in another mechanism, which is that you actually get more immune challenge when you're interacting with more diverse people, you get, more, uh, you get exposed to more pathogens, you get a stronger immune system when you're not just exposed to people just like you, because you uh, face more pathogens in the environment. So for all of these reasons, being exposed to a greater diversity of individuals, defined in a variety of ways, can foster, uh, in this experiment at least, uh, better health. And this set of causal pathways also highlights how psychosocial factors can affect our biology, either by directly causing biological changes or by influencing behaviors that then indirectly have such effects. And this study that I gave you in your readings was especially valuable because there can be no reverse causation here. It's not the case that the infection with the rhinovirus caused the network diversity, right? The network diversity was measured, then I expose you to the rhinovirus so I can experimentally see which comes first. Yeah, what's your name again? John. John. Yes, that's complicated, the doctor story. It also applies to preschool teachers. You know, the first few years you're a preschool teacher, you're just constantly sick. Some of you have parents who are elementary teachers. You know what I'm talking about. Um, but uh, eventually you get, you get uh, resistant. And that's incidentally also why um, people in middle age are less likely to get colds compared to you guys. Like, I've lived longer, so I've been exposed to many more pathogens. And so when I encounter a cold, I had mounted immune system response that's typically better. But it's actually much more complicated than that because all kinds of other changes are occurring in older people's bodies that can compromise immune response and so forth. So, um, so doctors, it's co more complicated because, yes, on the one hand, this chronic exposure can activate their immune system. But on the other hand, sometimes they're exposed to things that are quite bad. Uh, so to, dis to discern a mortality signal can be difficult. Some doctors die from infections and long-term and short-term infections they are exposed to in the care of their patients. So any benefits they get, you see it's countermanded by that cost. So you may not see a net benefit, is my point. Did I answer your question, John? No. Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Alexandra. Alexandra. If during the study you passed on they were working the entire time during the experience, then wouldn't that be able to apply the positive effects that were better received on them, such as like their friends taking care of them while they were staying? Yeah, so it's not instrumental support. That's really good. So there are different ways your friends help you. Uh, and the argument there was there's something about the kind of network that you have that is beneficial. So the pathways might be um, uh, you have improved self-worth. And that self-worth doesn't go away when you're suddenly quarantined, for example. Or uh, this is a speculative chart. So we don't, we maybe, maybe in fact we have better behaviors even when you're quarantined. But it's such a short period that that's not narrowly what's going on. Did I answer your question? Alexandra, right? Yeah. Yeah, Gianna. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of blew by that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I kind of, I, I, my little red, if you saw what I, I did a very 
typical professor sneaky thing. I just was like, well, I put the red arrow sort of there in the middle, and I, I said, these are lower than that, and oh, let's look at the women where the pattern is easier, and I just kept moving. Uh, but you guys are going to let me do that, so I don't know why, and maybe there's no difference statistically between those two bars, probably that's the truth. So these bars are probably distinguishable from each other, but they're both distinguishable from the orange bars, what I suspect. Okay. So, um, so there can't be reverse causation in this experiment. And in fact, there are many mechanisms by which social support might be salubrious. So now we're not just talking about attributes of the support, like the diversity or the amount or the reciprocity. Now we're going to talk about, well, how exactly is it that the support is helpful? Well, it could buffer stress, as we introduced the lecture with today. It could do something, having friends makes your body and you respond better to stress by psychological and biological mechanisms. You can have positive neuroendocrine effects. It can have positive cardiovascular effects. You can get better sleep and physiological repair. So if you have really annoying roommates, you don't sleep as well as if you have nice roommates. Uh, uh, you get encouragement of good behaviors with good friends. You get emotional support. You get practical support. They help you practically. Uh, you can get informational support. And they can promote meaning and coherence. This is the example we introduced at the beginning when we talked about the Nobel laureates and the Academy Award winners the benefit they get, they might feel like their life has meaning. And that itself can, be, uh, can have a variety of uh, beneficial uh, effects. But it turns out, actually, that any kind of connection can be helpful. So this is the nephew of Sam Southgate, who's an adorable little boy. Uh, but he's not very happy here until uh, you give him a pet. <laughs> And uh, actually, what happened is, poor, I had Sam take these photographs a couple of years ago. And actually, the little boy was actually holding his own uh, cat. But the cat like squirmed out at the last moment while the photograph was being taken. It was jumping out. So I asked Sam this year, I said, well, could we take another picture of the little boy? And Sam gave me these pictures where the cat has been photoshopped in. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a genuine photograph of his nephew who was genuinely happy with his real pet cat. Is that right? <laughs> Even though this cat has been rather expertly, I think, uh, <laughs> a shop in. So, uh, so it's not just connection to people. Remember, we introduced the idea of connection to God when we talk about religion. It's not just connection to people that matters. It may even just be connection itself. For example, connection to pets. And here's a study that compared spouses to friends and to pets. So 240 married couples were studied. And half of these married couples, they had a pet and half did not. And the pet owners are shown in the clear bars, and the non-pet owners are shown in the black bars. And then, while they were at home, various cardiovascular parameters, their heart rate and their blood pressure, were measured while the subjects were stressed. And do you guys know what the standard test stressful? If you want to experimentally introduce stress to someone, do you know what you're supposed to do? Anyone take psych and never done stress? Induce stress? OK, so one is you put your hand in an ice bucket. So you put the person's hand in an ice bucket, that seemed to be very stressful. Actually, the first second your hand goes in an ice bucket, you're like, God, I'm great, this doesn't bother me at all. And then actually your hand really begins to hurt pretty quickly after that. You know what the second classic one is? You give people a math test. <laughs> so these people went into people's homes and they said, I'm here to give you a math test and put your hands in ice. And, uh, and we're going to do that and we're going to experimentally manipulate whether you do it alone, whether your spouse is present, whether a friend is present, or whether a pet is present, whether your pet is present. And the task was be, uh, would be performed under different experimental conditions. So let's start by looking at the right panel. So here's the right panel. Here are the pet owners and the non-pet owners. Uh, here's what happens in terms of the millimeters of mercury of their blood pressure when they're given the stress test, whether it's the math test or the cold water immersion, their blood pressure goes up. And it goes up, uh, whether you're a pet owner or a non-pet owner, your blood pressure goes up roughly equally. Now, when we bring your spouse into the mix, your blood pressure doesn't go up as much, whether you're a pet owner or not. Everyone with me so far? And now we say you can either bring a pet or a friend into the test with you while you do it. If you're a pet owner, having the pet present really has a big impact on, uh, on whether or not your blood pressure goes up. So this bar is better than this bar, you see? So when you're alone, if you're a pet owner, you might go up by 25 or 28 millimeters of mercury. Whereas when you have a pet, it might go up by 15. Uh, when you have a friend present, it also is improvement. But actually, it's even better to have a pet than to have a friend. Because your benefit is much greater uh, 
for having a, a pet than it is for having a friend. So any connection, even to an animal, can have benefits here in this experimental setting in which we're measuring your response to stress. The presence of a pet or a friend decreases cardiovascular reactivity while under stress compared to being alone, compared to being alone, but having a pet is better for this cardiovascular response even than having a spouse or a friend present. In fact, I didn't highlight this, but it's also true that my wife would fare better if, if embarrassingly, if Rudy or Elsa were with her uh, than if I was with her, maybe not in my marriage, I hope, uh, uh, if, because in her blood pressure. And this looks at heart rate, and it basically shows the same results. Here we look at the beats per minute uh, rather than at the millimeters of mercury uh, elevation. So having a pet actually lowers your heart rate even when you're stressed uh, in this study, if you're a pet owner. Everyone with me so far? So any questions? What's your name? Joanna. Joanna. Yeah, I was looking at the um, bottom, because I think Tyler's going to speak about cats and dogs. Was there any um, discretion between the effects of cats and dogs? Let me get your cat over. <laughs> no, I don't have a cat. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. I don't remember. Maybe it's discussed. If one of you look up, you can let me know. I don't remember if there's a difference. I have to believe dogs are better. I mean, I mean, <laughs> cats really are indifferent to our friends, but the dogs are not. Other questions? Yeah, what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. Why do you think there's less benefit if you have a pet than an spouse versus like just having a I don't know, have you ever been in a situation where you have multiple of your friends present and you find it stressful to manage their relationships? Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I'm with my wife and our dogs, I find it much more stressful than I'm with either my wife or the dogs. <laughs> when I'm with all of them, it's more stressful. Basically, I feel jealous of the dogs, so, you know, I just, no. Um, so, um, but in all seriousness, I don't, know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure it's speculated in that part. Other questions? Yes, up, up, up there. Um, would uh, polygamy have more? Yes. Would that increase your health? Yes. I've thought about that would be a great study to do. So if, if having one wife adds seven years to your life, does having two add 14 years to your life? <laughs> uh, and uh, it's very difficult to do that kind of study. Uh, <laughs> Actually, it's really hard, econometrically, it's hard to imagine so-called exogenous sources of variation in, in the number of spouses. Because, for example, richer, in polygamous societies, richer men. There are very few polyandrous societies, and most polyandrous societies are, are fraternal. That is to say, one woman marries two brothers. And those societies also, typically in Himalayan countries and some Latin American countries or South American countries, have other very serious environmental issues, not issues, but differences compared to other circumstances. Polygamy is a little bit more polygyny is a little bit more widely distributed, but even within any given polygynous society, it's pretty uniform that uh, richer men have more wives. So it's very difficult to tease out um, you know, some kind of natural experiment where a man would have acquired two wives but didn't, and you compare those men to the ones that did, and then saw if having more than one wife. And very weirdly, when you, when you interview men and women, uh, men and women tend not to like polygynous societies. The women don't like it. I mean, it's widely understood. The women actually generally don't like being in polygynous societies, even though it's their own society. Uh, they find it very stressful, more so in non-sororal polygyny, so societies in which two sisters marry the same man, they already knew each other, they get along, um, they're less competition. But in societies in which uh, their non-sisters uh, marry, there are all kinds of other things that come with that. Typically, there's a bigger age gap between the wives, etc. It's, it's a mess. And the men often also say that it's not very uh, appealing. And they often conform to certain expectations and acquire more wives, but it's not what, what they really would describe as happy. And even in polygynous societies, many men, most men in a polygynous society typically only have one spouse, and even those that have more, and, and of those, some fraction is because they're poor, they can't get a second spouse, and some it's because they don't want a second spouse, they just want one. So it's hard, it's a good idea, but it's really hard to, to do that, to show that, yeah. Also a fantastic question. Uh, that, in theory, would be easier to do using, you know, for example, uh, certain Indian environments would be a really, you know, you could probably find natural experiments in India where arranged marriages are really common, even among high SES people. It's a very common scenario. 
even in second generation families in the United States whose parents immigrated, their offspring, it's not arranged in the sense that the young woman and young man who've been raised in this country have never met their spouse, like in the classic way, but there's a sense in which there's some, you know, they could refuse to marry this person, but there's an expense, a sense in which their parents probably have everyone's best interest in, in, in heart. There's probably a way you could look at natural variation uh, in that and try to identify an effect. I, I think that would be a great study. I don't believe it's ever been done. If anyone finds that it has been done, I'd love to see it, uh, some study like that, arranged marriages and, and uh, longevity. Uh, yeah? Um, I'm sure that's been done. It, what, what has been done is not divorce, but it turns out the death of a spouse, people have looked at marital quality, this is really depressing, people have looked at marital quality and the impact it has on, um, on the, the widowhood effect. And the death of a spouse that loves you is much worse than the death of a spouse that does not. So if you have a bad marriage and your spouse dies, there's not as big a widowhood effect as if you have a good marriage and the spouse dies. And I suspect, therefore, something similar uh, would happen in divorce. People have also looked at re-entry into marriage, and in fact, your risk of death goes down upon re-entry into marriage. So if you look among the widowed and the divorced, the curves inflect uh, upon re-entry into marriage. Any other questions? It's a really cool uh, area. So, in fact, it might, as I've already been saying, not just be connection to people that's important, but connection itself. And we're going to be spending some time, um, actually more than some, we'll spend three lectures looking rather deeply uh, at such social network effects more generally. How and why we assemble ourselves into networks and what it means for our lives. Uh, uh, next time we're going to be talking about uh, neighborhood effects, and then after the break we're going to be talking about network effects. Any other questions? See you next time. Thank you.